Thank you very much and um, welcome to the, I think the Australian leg of, or Australian New Zealand leg of um, Valofest. Very nice to be here. So uh, I wanted to talk about knowledge management in the new normal this morning. Um, and actually, if you're either dialed in from out of our region or watching the recording, uh, some of the conversation might be Australian specific, but hopefully you'll you'll um, be able to have, take away something from this as well. And I know that we've got um, with the people logged in, we've got the opportunity for people to ask questions as we go. Um, and certainly I'll, I'll be sort of posing a couple of questions. Now, this has been recording, so I won't put people on the spot and maybe ask you to to come on screen. But certainly if you can use the chat box and the, the Valo team can can pass some of that feedback on to me as we go. So look, we're going we're gonna to start the, the, the presentation this morning by talking about knowledge management, first of all, because it's actually a really big topic in itself. And there's no way that I could do it justice with even within an hour. Um, you know, it's just a, a huge, huge area. And it's certainly an area where, you know, it's really hard to define, actually. And that's not actually not a bad thing. Um, there's, there's lots of reasons why knowledge management is harder to, harder to find. In part, it's because there's lots of um, not just conflicting viewpoints about what knowledge management is about, but also it's quite a, a, a broad um, a broad discipline of different techniques and issues that we're concerned about. But I think fundamentally, it's also about people and people make things really complicated. But I think just some of the key the key points that make knowledge management hard to define is that um, a lot of it um, people say is really about what's in in your head. And there's a really famous saying about, you know, we know more, th more than what we can tell. Um, so that really makes knowledge management as a, as a concept, as a process, uh, one that's hard to deal with because how do you extract um, things from people's heads? At the other um, extreme, it can also be thought of maybe just a huge library of information. So it's, it's just things written down and that's what knowledge management is about. And probably a third um, sort of issue that we should think about and, and just trying to keep this fairly simple and not too much navel gazing is that when we're talking about knowledge management in the workplace, a, a lot of knowledge management actually happens while we're doing things. It's actually embedded in in the work we do, the, the business processes that happen and that we can't really sort of um, you know, just pull knowledge management out of that um, that sort of area um, in, in itself. So how do you actually deal with knowledge management if it's if it's embedded and hidden within the work we're doing? Now I'm quite quite keen, and as I said, maybe if you can throw some some comments into chat if you're if you're feeling brave, is you know whether you feel like you've got a, a really good working definition of knowledge management, or if you if you feel that yeah it's a bit of a fuzzy fuzzy topic. And so if you can put those into chat, and I'll get the Valo team to maybe read some of those back in a moment. Um, I'm going to try and keep this fairly pragmatic and practical. And again, that's not to say that there isn't a huge area of knowledge management that we could go and investigate, but I'd need a lot more time to go through that. So what I want to do in terms of not so much a working definition, but just to think about what are we trying to do with knowledge management and actually focus on the management part um, more than the, than the knowledge part, if you like. And, and from a management point of view, I think an easy way of thinking about it is that we're trying to create an environment that supports certain things. And yes, there is definitely a role for information that is written down or recorded in some fashion. Um, and that's about, um, I think, no value creating information practices. So it's not everything that's involved with information management. Um, you know, we've got re records management, we've got document management. Um, there's, there's all sorts of compliance around information. Um, intellectual property management is certainly a, a relevant and related um, field in terms of knowledge management. But what I want you to think about is that we're trying to focus on information that has value in some form. So it's information that either someone can take action on, it explains how to do something the best way. Um, maybe it's a record of someone's experience. And actually, when I say information, it could be in words, it could be pictures, it could be a video. Um, if, it, if it's data that's captured somewhere that has information and it's useful and valuable, that's what we're talking about. Um, not not all the not all the information in organisation is something that we need to worry about when we're talking about knowledge management. The the second pillar here is around the idea of networking people together. So we've got this information management side, and then on the other side of the coin is that actually there is a, a really important people component, and we're bringing people together so they can share knowledge in in a, in a way, and that might actually be creating new knowledge. It might be allowing helping people to reuse existing knowledge. Um, to test knowledge, to um, build our understanding of that knowledge, 
whatever we're doing um, in terms of that environment we're creating, we're trying to create those opportunities so that people can share that knowledge in whatever means, you know, whatever way is necessary. The final piece is that you know, one of the reasons we're doing this uh, in an organisation is that we're actually trying to um, help organisations um, change to avoid risks and make good decisions. So if you've got knowledge management in place, that's the sort of thing we should, the outcomes we should be expecting is, is it's easy to change or predict change or see change coming, um, make good decisions, avoid those those risks. And, that, and that's that's really, I think, for the purposes of this morning, I want you to focus on. Um, just the Valor team, I don't know if anyone's been um, brave enough to throw in any comments about their sort of thoughts on, on knowledge management and whether they, they feel they've got a good working definition. No, not at this stage, by the sounds of things. So uh, we'll, we'll keep going. I'll certainly leave that, that thought with you. Now, um, to just continue on this theme of, of business performance. When you actually look at a lot of the academic um, research and industry research around this, in terms of what that looks like, so you know, when you see an organisation that has some sense of knowledge management, and look, hey, they may not even call it knowledge management, really doesn't matter. But, but when you actually ask people say, you know, how does knowledge management contribute to an organisation? Some of the things that people often talk about is productivity and quality. It's about improving decision making, as I've mentioned, um, onboarding people, um, innovation and change, and also professional development. These are all the things where um, knowledge management can be a, a factor in helping that business. Again, I sort of really want to highlight, it doesn't mean that knowledge management is the entire thing. It's not the only thing. It's simply a if you like a kind of a lens that you can apply to your organisation to think about, well, how can knowledge man management help your business and the people within it to perform better? Um, people like Peter Drucker, though, have said in the past that he, he does think, though, that the um, single greatest challenge facing managers in the developed countries of the world is to raise the productivity of knowledge and service workers. So, you know, many, many years ago, Peter Drucker, um, you know, very well known management thinker, thought that knowledge was a really critical component to us actually um, creating competitive and high performance organisations. What I want to do though really uh, uh, in, in this presentation though is just sort of shift our thinking a little bit and actually turn our attention to, to the people, the individuals. So we so I've sort of made the, um, the point about how knowledge management might benefit uh, an organisation, how, it, um, how it's a factor in performance. But also, I think it's really important, and this, these days actually everyone is really interested in this idea of employee experience. So I think um, one thing to also recognise that on one side we've got this idea of organisational performance, so we want to improve organisations in some way. But also it's really important from an employee experience point of view. Knowledge management has a lot to, um, to contribute as part of your planning and thinking around employee experience. This is a really nice little visualisation um, from Dan Pink talking about what drives us. So, so rather than sort of going through all the different attributes of employee engagement, um, talking about employee experience and, and sort of how that relates to people around KM, I think these three um, uh, sort of highlights really make that point well. So if we think about what mo motivates us in our jobs, what keeps us engaged is the first thing is autonomy. So we're in control of what we do and how we do it. Well, knowledge management is about sharing knowledge. So if you actually have access to the information you need, for example, or if you can access um, uh, knowledge that can improve your skills so that you can do something um, yourself, um, that you have information to make, um, you have all the information you need to make a decision, you actually can be given autonomy. Um, the next level up is, is mastery. So if we think less around the sort of information, the information management side of knowledge management, we think more about the people and we want to improve our skills and services. Certainly within the area of learning and development, there's a framework called the 70-20-10 model. And what the, that model is talking about is that 10% you know, of learning might be things that are written down. But on that 70% side, that's where you actually learn from each other through social learning processes. So uh, KM actually has a, a lot to contribute in terms of that professional development that, that came up in the previous slide. And finally, purpose, working towards something worthwhile. If you've you know, looked at your organisation through a knowledge management lens, you're providing autonomy because people can access the information they need and as I said, the valuable information they need to do what they need to do, that you're providing a, a, a people network where you can support social learning. And again, these, these aren't the only things that, that, that um, are important here. But if we think about this building up in a bit of a maturity curve, if we then think about purpose, 
if you have access to all that, you know what an organisation is there to do, that you're empowered with your autonomy to do what you need to do and to, to build your mastery, um, then actually you're going to have purpose. I think the other thing as well, which is often um, important around purpose, is that in a, in a transparent organisation where, where knowledge management is, is valued and applied, um, you'll actually have an idea of what's going on. And, and actually, is your organisation working in the right way? Are they, are they, are they making the right decisions? Are they using all the information available to them and the knowledge in the organisation to make um, you know, ethical um, decisions or, or decisions that support what's important to the people that work there? So knowledge management is good for organisations, but it also um, can be a, a factor or a tool, if you like, in the employee experience as well. OK, so we've established that then. Now I want to put it into the Australian context because this is about knowledge management in the new normal. And of course, we all know about keeping your distance. Unfortunately, at this time, we've got um, some, some mini outbreaks happening in Victoria, um, and which really just reinforces the importance of the, the, I guess, the key message that we've heard throughout this, this pandemic is about keeping a distance. Now, that's having a big impact on, on not just, um, I, I guess, us being in lockdown at certain times or being restricted on where we can go. But when we go out into businesses, for example, They've all put um, policies and procedures in to try and help people keep their distance. And then going back to the office, you may find that um, there are strict rules about um, you know, how closely people can sit together. We've heard talk about controlling the number of people in lifts. Um, but you know that's within the office environment, so that's quite disruptive in itself. But when you actually look at some of the recent news, that's actually having a bit of a knock-on effect. So I think the first one is, and this is talking about Sydney CBD, and I'm, I'm sure this is playing out across other Australian cities is that when people aren't going into the office or fewer people are going into the office, it actually has a knock on effect then into the actual, if you like, the, the human network that gets created around centres of, of where we work. So CBDs um, or other industrial areas where people all come together to work, even for different companies, that actually creates lots of opportunities for knowledge management to happen outside of the, the organisational boundary because you're networking with customers, with um, clients, prospective clients, um, your peers from other organisation. There's an immense amount of knowledge being shared just through those informal um, social networking that happens just by having everyone in, in one place. And then I think what's even um, a bigger issue as well is that we're kind of restricted on where we can go. I mean, within Australia, it's quite restrictive at the moment, but there's certainly no, for most people, there's going to be no overseas travel for some time. So thinking about, from again, from a knowledge management point of view, we're, we're creating so social dif distance within our offices, so that's going to inhibit how we can exchange knowledge. We actually um, ha have social distance within our cities, so those other extended networks are going to be challenged. And, and actually, you know, how often do you go out of your office maybe to have a coffee from the comp with, a, with the person you work with in your own organisation? We kind of need these, these social spaces, those physical spaces for knowledge management to happen. And then finally, if we can't travel overseas, that's going to really inhibit our ability to go and get um, new ideas from North America and Europe, um, or just to, even to travel to other cities to get a different perspective within Australia. So the social distance actually is a huge issue for how, how we um, share knowledge within organisations because we can no longer just network with people. So, um, you know, and that's the thing that happens naturally. The, the valuable information side of knowledge management is the thing that often takes um, a, lot, a lot more work. But we also forget, I think, that uh, the, the informal organic knowledge sharing just happens because that's part of being human. But, but with social distancing and all the things that come with that, that's, that's going to make things really difficult. Um, now, again, I might just ask Valentin to maybe look out for some comments. I'd, I'd love to know if anyone's actually gone back to the office and, and what's that experience been like for you? If, from a, if you think about it from a social side and a knowledge sharing side, uh, yeah, how, how have you experienced um, you know, going back to the office during a during a, pan, a pandemic. So, yeah, th throw some comments into into Teams if you, if you, if you feel like doing that. Now, um, let's, let's, let's dive into this a little bit more. Um, now, what I've got here is I actually uh, put together some user journeys for a project, and it was looking actually at the role of technology in a modern office. How how technology can actually support the employee experience of being a, a, an employee, a worker within that building and how it might play out. Now, these aren't from one journey. I've, I've actually pulled some vignettes from different parts of the story, 
just to talk through again about what's changed from pre-COVID-19 and perhaps what's going to happen moving forward. And I think um, one of the areas actually that's often associated with, with knowledge management in organisations at the moment is actually around IT support as its own little um, focus area for knowledge management. So um, now I actually have seen lots of um, reports and um, statistics that show that where you provide face to face technical support and where it's provided where people are actually working. So, you know, the, the sort of tech bars you find in some large organisations now, people's satisfaction with that tech support is really, really high. Um, so that's that's going to be one challenge, I think, if we're um, not working all working in the office or we've got social distancing happening, we're going to have to really fall back on that remote support again. And we're not going to have that that face to face experience of really getting the knowledge of the, of the people that know how your your systems work or how to troubleshoot your your, your devices. Um, but also, as I said, you know, one of the other big challenges around um, social distancing is it inhibits our ability to access people. Um, so again, these vignettes are all about supporting a, a, the old, the old traditional view of the office. So, so trying to augment things to help them. So the idea is that technology would be a, perhaps a helper to find expertise. So if you're looking for someone who could had a particular skill within your organisation, you actually might turn to technology to see whether they're available right now. Maybe they're just down the corridor um, and you can go and talk to them. Again, we have to flip this now because we can't assume that that person with that right skill is going to be in the office when you need them. Um, moving on, we've got creating opportunities for serendipity. Uh, when, when you talk to people that are involved with designing office space, this is often one of the things they're re really working hard to achieve, which is those random encounters. So again, we were looking in the past about, well, you know, you're, you're going around the office, you're maybe going downstairs to grab a coffee and, and, and you might bump into someone and have a really useful, interesting conversation. Um, but you might also use that time to check up on your um, the activity feed from your digital workplace to see what else is going on. But again, we're flipping this around now. If you if you want to have serendipity in the virtual world, um, how, how might we do that? How, how might we bring people together who might not normally talk? Um, the particular organisation I put this set of uh, employee um, user journeys together for as well was, was um, certainly adopting agile practices. So they had, uh, like a lot of organisations now, they placed a lot of emphasis on showcases for opportunities for learning and reflection on the work that had been happening. And again, these are about bringing people together um, to have that social face-to-face -face exchange of knowledge. So again, that's going to have to flip. So you can see there's a bit of there's a bit of a, a, a theme here. You know, peer-to-peer -peer knowledge sharing. You know, informally with a, a manager or a peer. Um, we know that often, you know, when people go looking for information, they'll turn to the person next to them to ask them for help before they actually use technology. We're flipping all these things around. Access to project information history again. If you've been into a large organisation that again has a design thinking or an agile approach to, to either their technology or how they operate, you're going to find things stuck on the wall everywhere. Um, that's great when you're all co-located. That's all going to have to move online. And, then, and again, um, side by side review and analysis, we're so used to maybe just you know, sitting down with someone and, and looking at a, a single screen together to, um, to review something or work out what something means. And again, we're going to have to change how we work. And finally, recognition and presence. Previously, we were talking again about augmenting the fact that some people were occasionally working remotely or maybe a, a part of a project team, but based in another office. And how could we make sure they weren't forgotten? Again, now we're going to have to turn this around and, and make sure that everyone isn't forgotten because we're not all going to be in the office potentially at the same time. So there's all these little places um, of knowledge exchange that happen, knowledge sharing or social capital building. Um, which is important for, for knowledge management to happen. You've got to trust the people you work with um, it will potentially be removed if we're not all in the office at the same time and working in the way that we, we used to. So there's a, there's a bit of a call to action here to, to rethink knowledge management in, in what the future of this um, uh, current pandemic and post pandemic um, office work scenario is going to look like. Now, um, let's now start talking about how does this all, all come together with your intranet and your your digital workplace. So if you think about it, you know, we really boil down an intranet or the other tools you might have as part of your digital workplace in, from, a, from the point of view of uh, pr general productivity and social networking, all those sorts of things. Um, we've got a combination of three things. We've got um, content, of course. Um, you know, our technology tools are very content centric. Again, whether it's 
information that's written down, whether it's um, video or audio, whatever it might be, there's a lot of content within our in our intranets. What we've got um, certainly as well in this current era of intranets and digital workplaces is um, a strong um, identity element. You know, the very early intranets were web pages that really didn't know who you were. There was very, you know, very little personalization, but also the systems weren't particularly sophisticated in terms of that content presentation. These days, though, every intranet you use is going to know who you are. So, um, so it's we've we've got that factor now. So we've got content, and we know who you are. And the final piece, and again, it depends on the tools you've got, are either going to be passively tracking activity that you know what page did you look at, or you as the user, because we know who you are, we've got your identity. You may actually be creating content, even a, you know a comment is a kind of content, and that activity is, is being tracked. So we've got content, we know who you are, and we're seeing what you're doing. Um, now. Those touch points then come through in terms of the internet and digital workplace in these, these six sort of key areas, I think. Um, one is people profiles. We can actually see who people are, and in some systems, you can actually see what they've been doing, what they've been working on, or who they know. So we can actually, um, you know, you can see a bit of a, 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 a the basics of name and number, but also those people profiles potentially tell you something about that person. Um, not just who they are, but what they do and what they've been doing and who they're connected with. Which of course leads us on to the social network side. Um, so we've got people, we've got social networks where people are coming together to um, talk and collaborate in different ways. That leads to user generated content as well. So there's the formal content that your internal comms team, for example, or HR might generate. But you know, the bulk of the content in a digital workplace is actually user generated content, not that centralized content. Now, as we think more and more about the knowledge man management aspects, and certainly, as you can see, because I've emphasized the people component, those first three, three things are really important. But equally, if we look at the next layer, the next sort of row of, of, of items, we actually need to help people find and discover. And, and this is more than just search. This is about helping us to find that, that valuable information, not every piece of information. So just keep that in mind. There's a, there's a really important distinction between providing a search tool that lets you search everything um, versus a tool that uh, that actually lets you find and discover information. Sometimes it's actually not a search tool you need. It's actually a, a, what I would call a knowledge map, which is is something that will uh, address a particular topic or idea and actually put it in context and help you discover useful information. Um, and so it's a slightly different idea from simply searching for information. The other thing is, of course, is pertinent content. So I need content that I can use. It's valuable. There's an idea of you know the, the right information getting to the right person at the right time, um, and pertinent content actually you know for one person um, they might see a piece of information on an intranet and it's actually not pertinent or valuable to them at that, either that point in time or ever. Um, another user can come along and look at that same information and actually find that information very pertinent. So um, you know content can be very fluid and it's it's very relative to what you're trying to do, what your job is, and your background and experience and all those things. And I've also talked about social learning as well, because um, again, that might be part of an e-learning system, but even within a social network, uh, you might have a community of practice or a community of interest where they're actually building up their own knowledge base, their own personal knowledge base through the interactions with each other. So we've got quite a few touch points between KM, uh, what the fundamental attributes of an intranet and a digital workplace have around that content identity and activity, and then some elements here that we should really be um, thinking about from a knowledge management point of view. Again, um, just emphasizing that we're just taking quite a narrow view of, of knowledge management here to keep it practical. But these are six things, six things I think you should be thinking about from a KM perspective. And, and, and actually, you may notice in a way, these aren't exclusive to knowledge management as well. You might use a social network as part of your internal communications engagement strategy, and that's fine. We're talking about overlapping ideas. It's that idea of knowledge management being used as a lens to understand firstly what your internet and digital workplace um, should do, but also what it might be able to do that it's not currently doing. Um, now, this now again reflect on the changes that have happened because of COVID-19. So um, we know that that physical social distancing is going to have a big impact on our ability to share knowledge. So I just want to call these particular things out because this is what needs to change, is going to have to change moving forward. So the first one is about building and sustaining social capital. 
again, when you've got an office full of people, a lot of this just happens organically. Um, and, and again, people will come into a job having worked for another organisation. They have a network of people outside of the organisation as well that they would have developed social capital with over time. Um, thinking about when you're at university, you may have friends from university that you still um, stay in contact with from a professional point of view. That's all part of your own network and you've got social capital within that network. But if we're not talking to each other face to face, that social capital can easily start to dissipate. So we need to look at how we can use our intranets, digital workplaces in a very deliberate way now to, to not just build because um, new people coming in, business um, priorities might change, um, your know, organisational structures change, so you have to build it up. But also once you've built up that social capital, you've got to sustain it. Another um, area to think about is this concept, which just, just to summarise it, I've called working out loud. And, and you can certainly go and Google that and learn all about working out loud. But what it suggests is it's not about making um, noise, it's actually about a deliberate approach to making what you're doing explicit and, and open and available to other people. Um, so as you're perhaps working on a project at the end of the week, you might put write up a short um, um, blog post, for example, just to share some of the things that you've done and, and what you've learnt and things that you think it will be valuable for other people to know. So when I say deliberate, working out loud is a bit of a skill because you're trying to um, think about not just a, a fire hose of activity updates. You know, I, you know, I saved a document, um, I emailed some people. That's not working out loud. Working out loud is about saying, look, um, this is I did this and this is why I did it. Um, or if you're doing something like this, you should consider doing X or Y or you know, have a look, look at this template. So it's been very deliberate about what you share with your peers at work, um, deliberately trying to help them by sh sharing what you know and what you've learned. Um, now, I'm just going to drop down to the bottom and just talk about this one about removing unnecessary gatekeeping, because again, for all the benefits of face to face and social capital and social networks, some people will actually use those as a way to um, maybe control their, um, I guess, how their, their own work happens or their position within an organisation. There's often a lot of self-interest in keeping information private um, so that you have to go to that person to ask for it. Um, what we want to do as much as possible is actually get information out there so that people can access. Now, there is a link back to social capital because, and this is where the, the KM lens is really valuable. There are lots of human behavioural issues that will impact our willingness to share information. It's not always for negative reasons. Sometimes people have genuine reasons because they're not sure who's going to use that information and how it will be used. So these things do not all happen in isolation. You've got to think about these as, as collective issues and you've got to um, come up with strategies and ultimately tools and technologies to help address these issues. Um, that just um, bring us though back over to um, the last couple of points here. One is that um, you know traditionally we've looked at intranets and digital workplaces as, as um, and particularly on the internet side as destinations. And what I mean by that is that if I need a piece of information, I go to the home page, I navigate through a sitemap, and I find the piece of information that I need, and then I go away. Um, now that reference model, if you like, certainly does have a, a time and a place, and it's still needed. But in a digital workplace, in a, in, a, in a workplace where we've got distributed and remote teams, people working from home, um, what we actually need to do is remove some of the friction there though, because one, I've, got to, I've either got to remember to go and look at the homepage, and every time I go back to the homepage, if I haven't used it for a long time, I actually forget how to use it. I mean, it doesn't matter always how good your sitemap is, people are gonna forget that sitemap, and that creates friction and extra thinking, extra work. What we wanna do, is take all that great content and actually bring it into the tools that they're working with. And I think that's actually a bit of a gap um, in, in sort of recent times. You know, our digital workplaces are becoming quite sophisticated, but I think we're now entering an era where we've got a lot more options about how we bring that knowledge um, knowledge to actually where work is being done. And you know, some of those things might be bots, they might be browser um, add-ons, it might also be just simply taking that content and embedding it into the app that people are using. There's lots of ways of doing it, um, and we didn't really have those in the past, but that's something I'd really emphasize is that we've got to forget about the homepage being at the key destination. We've actually got to take all that content, and it's got to live there, so it will still live in your internet. We've actually got to get it to where people are working. Um, I've also talked about the fact that user-generated content is important to knowledge management, and a self-service content strategy 
is uh, an important component here. And that, that's got two sides to it. A content strategy is often thought about from a very centralized communication model. And again, it goes back to that sitemap. Can you come up with a content strategy with the right sitemap and the right content? And that's really important. Um, but we've also got to think about the fact that people need to be able to contribute to that model as well from a working out loud point of view from building social capital. People have got information and knowledge they need to contribute as well. So it can't be just a centralized out model of content management. You've really got to think about a distributed democratic system of um, content management, but it's also got to be, it's got to work for people. We've still got to be able to find that content. It can't just be a complete free for all. And finally, I think um, people have been doing really well during um, COVID-19, adopting new tools and technologies um, really, in many cases, having to learn how to work differently, and that's been going OK. Um, but remember that you know, we're entering a period of a, a different way of working in the world for all the reasons we've talked about. And what works for you today, that's great. But in a few months time, hopefully your organisation may hire people um, and they would have worked in a different way where they've been working. Um, they won't know about the knowledge within your organisation. So it's not enough just to come up with new ways of working. We've also got to think about how we onboard people. And again, this is all just um, things that have been simmering away in the background that we've relied on that face-to-face -face interaction in our offices and workplaces to deal with in either an organic or sometimes actually with a, a focus on employee experience because that face-to-face -face interaction has value. But if we're not having that face-to-face -face, um, time as much, then we've really got to turn to technology and find some ways of um, doing that in a better way and enhancing all of these issues. Um, now, what about project context? Um, because you're here on a Valofest uh, sort of series of events, there's a very strong Microsoft uh, flavor to this, of course, and I'm sure some of you are wondering, well, hang on, when I heard you were gonna talk about knowledge management, I thought this was all gonna be about project cortex. And I do wanna mention project cortex because it does hold a lot of potential. Uh, I think, um, also, when you look at what Project Cortex does and you look at what I've been talking about this morning, there's actually um, a lot of alignment here. So it's about connecting people to knowledge. Um, actually, what we're talking about is that valuable information and it's organized through shared topics. So that, that idea of a self-service content strategy, if you like, is here as well, is we, we want to put it together topics so that it makes sense for the work that people are doing. What Project Cortex is doing though is that content processing. It's the using things like the Microsoft Graph and Microsoft AI to help us categorize content or automate that process. And that's often been a barrier in the past to knowledge management is that on the information side, it takes a lot of effort to put, put information into a, a system or, or a way that, that makes sense to people so they can actually help them with the work they're doing. Um, so yeah, that's what Project Cortex is doing. It's really just making knowledge management a lot more scalable. Um, as I said, there is a there is a, a place for things like intellectual property um, protection and management, and so. But I'm not going to com comment so much on the content compliance. But that's obviously something you get out of the Microsoft ecosystem by by using Project Cortex as well. I'm going to come back to this a little bit later though, because this all sounds wonderful. It's very technology focused, and again, there's huge potential with Project Cortex, um, with getting that scalability and maybe sustainability through automation. But it's not all still about the technology. Um, as I said, but we'll come back to that in a, in a little bit. Now, um, let's, let's, let's turn. Hopefully, I've convinced you that we need to do knowledge management now, if you haven't been, in a more deliberate way. Um, as I said, knowledge management is not necessarily a thing in its own right, and there's, there's a lot of depth to the whole spectrum of what knowledge management can be, but in, in the narrow context of what we're talking around, intranets, digital workplaces, the, the environment we've got to work in. Hopefully I've convinced you that, that you perhaps need to take that or have a look at what you're doing with your internet and your digital workplace through that knowledge management lens. So the obvious next step, well, I need to probably build a business case, right? I need to take this to my manager or management or the leadership team and say, hey, we sort of need to have a, a view or a strategy around how knowledge management can enhance what we're doing with our workplace, considering we're not going to be working together face to face as much as we would have done in the past. And, you know, all the best practices around virtual teams are about getting teams together, even physically from time to time. You may not be able to do that. So, we, you know, as I said, hopefully I've convinced you that there's a bit of a call to action for that. But thinking about this business case, 
I want to go back to what I talked about at the beginning, though, that there is an organisational layer to this of, of the benefits that you can draw on. So it's definitely about, um, you know, again, in a more distributed or remote working environment, or people are talking about this idea of a hybrid working environment where some people are in the office and some aren't. Um, all those issues I've talked about um, or benefits apply for a business, you know, productivity, helping with onboarding, improving decision making, and, and they're great. I think, though, what you've got to emphasise when you look at your drivers and use cases, though, is to, again, meld it with that employee experience. Because, you know, despite the, um, you know, organisations, uh, some people are, are being made redundant, for example, some industries are going to be changed significantly through this. If you've actually got staff, um, those, those issues of motivation are still there. And, and you shouldn't put together your drivers and use cases purely on the business operational benefits. You need to meld it with that employee experience side and think about how KM can actually help the, you know, the individual user. It's really about, if you want to really, again, simplify this, it's about answering the what's in it for me. Why should I participate in your systems and tools from a knowledge management point of view if I don't get some kind of benefit from it? So if you really want to, want to sort of simplify that, that's what we're trying to do. Don't just talk about the business benefits. You've really got to also talk about the benefits to the organisation through that employee experience lens as well. Now, in terms of solutions, there are then really four high level areas you might want to focus on or, or problems you want, want to solve. And the first one is around expertise and experience. So do the people in your organisation, um, can they find and access that expertise and experience that exists within your organisation? And actually, if it doesn't exist within your organisation, do they know how to go and access it if, if it needs to be um, acquired externally through whatever means that might be? But it's, but it's all about saying that, yeah, we, in order for us to operate effectively, we need to better access that expertise or experience so we can you know, make a good decision, know how to do something well, whatever it might be. And that, and that sort of talks sometimes to that quality and improved decision making business case. You might also then um, perhaps choose to focus more on the social networks. And again, these things can support each other, but the social networks is really about uh, more of that organic um, emphasis on um, creating opportunities for people to share what they know, um, that social capital building. You might well already have some kind of enterprise social network, um, but if people are just sharing you know, cat photos, wedding photos, all those sorts of things, um, again, that can be great for um, some elements of employee engagement and can contribute to that employee experience because you know, if you create a nice friendly place to work, that actually gives you a great foundation for knowledge management sometimes because you, you're building that social capital. But when I'm talking about social networks here, I'm talking about trying to look at them more deliberately as places to share knowledge, peer-to-peer -peer knowledge, or from um, experts to people that need to acquire no knowledge, whatever it might be. Even that idea of a senior leader participating in a social network, removing those layers that might normally be between the leaders and, and employees, um, that's actually an opportunity for them to share knowledge at a very strategic level. So you can have a, if you like a strategic knowledge sharing, those are the important conversations that, that help people navigate and understand how the organisation operates. You can also have more tactical um, knowledge sharing through social networks. You know, how do I, how do I fix this? How do I do this? Um, so yeah, that's the social network side. That does lead us into learning and development. Um, you know, the world of knowledge management, when I started out 20 years ago, was very separate from HR and L&D. Um, more progressive um, learning and development practitioners now have actually um, been taking on board a lot of um, ideas from knowledge management. Hopefully as well, knowledge management being what it is, should also be looking at L&D and, and taking ideas from that domain as well. But learning and development and knowledge management, even though they sometimes use different terminology, there's actually a really strong natural affinity. And if you're interested in that, definitely go and look at the, you know, go and Google uh, the 70 20 10 model, and that will put some of that into context. Finally, we get to the information management side. And actually, this is sort of where a lot of that project cortex concept comes in is, you know, is, is there certain pieces or areas of information that we have that if we could organize them better and people could access them where they need them, we can actually operate more effectively. Um, again, so productivity, quality, um, sometimes innovation and change by having access to the right information can lead you to, to um, you know, new discoveries or new insights, whatever it might be. But, but you, can, you can sort of choose to tackle the information management side. Once, you, once you've kind of understood your drivers, the kinds of solutions you're, you're going to be focusing on, 
the last piece then is the outcomes. And now you might actually need to daisy chain some different um, strategies together to get to where you want to come to. So if you think about um, the idea of um, expertise and experience, you know, your first step might be about building up your social networks, that social capital, before you can build into expertise and experience. Um, but also the information management side might be critical. And again, if we're thinking about um, Project Cortex and its reliance on the Microsoft Graph, think about working out loud and people actually um, sharing information within the Office 365 ecosystem. That's all important to actually build up the effectiveness of, of Project Cortex. So again, you, you might have to daisy chain these things together to get ultimately where you want to be. But the things you should be then looking at, though, at a high level around outcomes are going to be around performance improvement. Um, so that's the organisation doing better. Uh, from a people side of view, we're going to be looking at things like cohesion and alignment. So you can be looking at actually things that uh, if you talk to your HR team, for example, you can actually use things out of your employee engagement surveys if you do them or pulse surveys to, to start to measure that. And there are some you know tools out there like Swoop Analytics that actually show you how your social networks, how cohesive they are. But we're, we're, those are the people sort of outcomes. I think you can also look at competitive advantage, although it's it's it can be tricky to to measure the, the link between what you're doing in knowledge management and getting that competitive advantage. Many years ago, I worked for Ernst & Young. Um, that's really where I, I learned a lot about knowledge management. And one of the, the, the classic arguments that our global CKO would make at the time is that they would look at the profitability, profitability of Ernst & Young and they look at headcount and, and they would sort of argue that profitability was rising faster than headcount and, and they put that down to the knowledge management strategy. The last one I want to touch on though is um, employee satisfaction. So cohesion and alignment is about the people networks, but it's about it's about the collective, it's about everyone. Think about employee satisfaction, that goes back to you know what drives us, what, what do the individual people say they feel about working in your organisation, are they happy to be there, do they want to stay? Are they going to tell their friends to come and work for that organisation? Knowledge management can definitely play a role in supporting that. So again, it's not, not the silver bullet, it's not the only thing, and that's not what I'm saying, but certainly it should be part of your strategy. Um, yeah, checking on time. So what do you do next? Okay, you're probably saying this is all great. You're sold now. You really need to be thinking about knowledge management. What, what can you do? So here's six different ideas. Um, if you're trying to understand really the who, the what and the where, the classic technique in knowledge management is to do a knowledge audit. It's literally go out and see what have you got, who knows what, what information do you have and, and where are those things. So uh, think about a content audit you might do on your intranet. A knowledge audit is a little bit like that, but we're going to we're going to list more than just content. We're going to we're going to list people and places effectively. Uh, you can also just look at the people. So organisational network analysis will tell you about who is talking to who or where do people go to, to get advice or access um, expertise. And often you'll find it looks nothing like your organisational chart. So that's another activity you can do. You can also do what I call a knowledge landscape review. And that's more of a, a diagnostic on practices and it's used to generate discussion about what the blockers or barriers or opportunities around knowledge management might, might, might be. And that's actually a pretty easy, quick process to run. Depending on, on what level of detail you want, you can run a, a knowledge landscape review as a combination of survey and workshop if you want. So that's actually quite a, a good way of getting into it. And not so much effort as the knowledge audit. It's kind of a precursor to a knowledge audit potentially. And it goes beyond what uh, organisational network analysis is going to tell you about the people relationships. Um, you can also be a bit targeted. Um, you know, knowledge management can look at your whole organisation or you can actually look at specific processes and look at what information or knowledge do people need across that process and how do they access that and are they actually accessing the best information and knowledge during that process. Um, so that's another good way of kind of scoping this to something that might be a bit more manageable. Um, definitely think your content strategy for your intranet should consider knowledge management as well. So don't again do that in isolation, don't just do a content strategy for your intranet that only considers internal comms or HR, for example. Think also about around the knowledge management side of things. You know, what, what, what role can your intranet play in hosting content, accepting content from people across the organisation that actually is useful and valuable to others? And finally, the last piece is employee experience. 
Um, this is a technique that I'm sure you would have heard of. It's used across intranets and digital workplaces already. It definitely has a role here for your, um, your knowledge management planning as well, because again, this user experience research is about going out and finding what people do. It's kind of a bit like the process mapping and the organizational network analysis in a way and the knowledge audit, because you're actually going out and exploring and seeing for yourself what, what people are doing, what they're using. Um, what you can do with that then is actually incorporate the knowledge management perspective into user research and do it as one thing across your intranet or digital workplace. You don't have to do a separate knowledge management user research project necessarily. You can do. Um, it's just about bringing that lens to bear to what you're doing with employee experience. Now, finally, let's just talk about roles and responsibilities. You've built the use case and you're going to go out and do some things to find out where the opportunities are for knowledge management in your organisation. But you know, you're actually going to need some people to do knowledge management, to, to look after knowledge management in your organisation. Now, Microsoft have come out with some, some suggestions on knowledge network roles for Project Cortex. Um, that's kind of a, a, a good starting point. Again, remember though, this is limited to Project Cortex. One thing I just want to highlight is the role of the knowledge manager, where it talks about them being responsible for the quality of information shared. They select resources to be mined, the structure and the visibility of knowledge. So. Project Cortex, think of it as a scaling tool, but it's not a tool that is um, free of human involvement, if you like. And likewise, they talk about subject matter experts as well. I think actually, you know, the Project Cortex is brand new. Um, this is giving you some good advice to manage your expectations about the idea that there are people involved in this process. But I can tell you from 20 years of working in KM, the idea of that knowledge management role and subject matter expert and how that actually works in practice is, is, is going to be a lot more complicated than you might think. Um, now, the other thing as well, talking about sort of experience is when you look at roles and responsibilities around KM, again, it can overlap into other areas. Um, our industry experience says there's no one right way of organising um, for knowledge management in a business. Um, there's a combination of strategic and operational activities that need to happen. So you need someone to champion knowledge management, to work out the strategy and the vision, to coordinate with other business functions, to get that coordination happening. But they may also be very um, on the ground operational activities, whether that be things like um, community management or it could be um, content management, technical support, whatever it might be. There's lots of operational activities that support KM and may well support other things you're doing in your intranet and um, digital workplace as well. You've got to work out ownership and structure. You're going to need funding as well. Um, and, and actually what might happen and what I've seen is different models that you, but they generally all have a mix of the following functions. There's a bit of community management, so that's great. If you've got a, someone already doing that employee engagement in your Yammer network, for example, it's not actually a hard job to start getting them to also think about taking on a knowledge management role as a connector of people and information. Um, content management, I think it's definitely very important to knowledge management, but again, we're focused often on the valuable content your knowledge management function could actually manage all content if you wanted to. It could be records, document management, intranet, whatever you want it to be. Capability development is around digital skills and knowledge sharing skills and um, developing leaders to, again, exhibit the right knowledge um, sharing behaviours. Um, there also be things around training people on how to use the tools. And finally, technology management, of, of course, is there as well. And we see that in Project Cortex where you've got a content services admin. So. Yeah, just to reiterate, there's no one right model. There is certainly overlap with things you'll be doing around your intranet, your digital workplace, across IT, potentially HR, L&D. Um, but you can you can certainly build a structure that works for your organisation. There's not a not a one size fits all process here. And um, yeah, finally, this is because we're coming up to um, ten to ten to the hour. A bit of a summary then. What is knowledge management? Well, as I said, it's a really big topic. Um, there's lots to explore there. I've only really just focused on a very narrow perspective of knowledge management. Um, so don't worry that, um, that go and explore that if you want to. And there's actually lots of insight that will help you what you're doing, even within a very specific focus area. But just, just think about what I talked about, what you're trying to do in, in terms of creating an environment. It's about managing valuable information. It's about creating the opportunity to share knowledge. And we're trying to support um, the performance of your business. Um, and again, in this new environment of COVID-19, what has changed? is we can no longer just leave it to that um, serendipity of face-to-face -face interactions happening in our workplaces, in our cities, when we travel to new places. Um, that's going to be limited, so we need to uplift that with technology to, to maintain the same um, outcomes and maybe even go further. 
Um, for your intranets and digital workplaces, again, look at the overlaps. Use knowledge management as a bit of a lens to see how you can do more with your intranets and your digital workplaces and think about those themes I, I went through. And finally, building the business case. Um, you may need to daisy chain different initiatives together. And there are many ways of doing this. You can actually, as I said, you can also bundle this in with the other activities you might already be doing in terms of de designing and maintaining your intranet or digital workplace as well. So, you know, knowledge management can be a thing in its own right, um, but I think the, the best approach is to think about it as a lens and incorporate it into what you're doing already. But, but, but be clear, I think, with people about why you're doing it and what the benefits are to both the organisation and to you and, and the people you work with as well. And perhaps leave you with this question is, what's the risk of not having a coherent KM vision and operating model? What does that mean for your business moving forward? As I said, if we're going to be working differently, um, apart a lot more than we used to be and not having access to these informal places for, for sharing knowledge that we've we've all been used to um, in, our, in our careers to date. Um, so thank you very much. And the, any any questions? If not, there's a few um, links. To, I'm going to share some knowledge here. There's a great digital workplace buyer's guide you can download. Barlow is mentioned in that guide. There's a link there. I've got some content on my site talking about how you should organise your knowledge management function. So it goes into a little bit more detail. And actually, again, about this idea of putting knowledge into context, you might want to have a look at what makes the better start page, Microsoft SharePoint or Teams. And there's a lot more content on my website to explore as well. Um, back to you, Valentin. Great, thank thank you very much, James. Uh, that was that, uh, that. There was one comment in the in the in the chat uh, about uh, experience of of, of uh, how how the uh, degradation uh, how the internal communication degraded uh, after after returning to office because you know people were very aware of of this uh, situation when everybody was was uh, working from home, but now. Returning to the office, maybe you get the feeling that everything is back to the same than, than before, but maybe it's not. Maybe there's there are still people working from home and, and maybe the old old uh, manners don't anymore more work. What's your comment on that? Yeah, look, I, I was recently interviewed about this and if you think about an office actually as a factory for knowledge work, it's not a very particularly nice um, you know, image in your head. But if you just think about that for a second, that we, we're getting people into an office, a bit like an, an, it's kind of knowledge factory. And what's the benefit of that? It's about having people all in the same place at the same time. Um, and so I think the, the the impact, again, this is particular to Australia where, you know, for the most part, we, we've gone through this pandemic, you know, a lot better state than a lot of other countries at the moment. Um, so, so what going back to the office means for us is going to be very different from other parts of the world. And in some organisations, you know, they're saying they're going to dump the office completely and go distributed. Um, and that, that introduces very similar issues, but actually we've got different issues to deal with is that in the past we might have had say five to 10%, maybe less, you know, whatever it might be of people working from home at any one point in time. Um, telework has never been particularly popular in this part of the world, so it's mostly people working flexibly. Um, if you think of that percentage growing, maybe 30, 40, even 50% of the time, people will be working away from the office. That really changes everything about how we work. Even though the office might still be the same and people are still going to the office, having more people not in the office at the same time, in a way actually creates a bigger bigger challenge for us to deal with. Because, you know, you know everyone will know what it's like trying to run a meeting where you've got a couple of people dialing in remotely, that's hard enough. But where you've got half and half situation, that's it going to be even more difficult. So yeah, things will feel, I think, for Australians, New Zealand as well, very similar. But I think they'll find that it's going to be a very, it's going to be a different experience when we when we look at it from a knowledge management perspective. Great, thank you. All right, I think uh, we are running out of time, unfortunately, uh, for uh, for this session. Uh, let me.